Hello, my name is Cynthia Terrazas and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. The Dole Student Advisory Board is compromised of KU students committed to the bipartisan mission of the Dole Institute. Members of the SAB receive many great opportunities. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. We would like to encourage each of you to get special benefits and support the Dole Institute by becoming a friend of the Dole Institute. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our website's email. Hearing assistance is available and we have a loop seating section at each program designated by a sign. If you have any questions about the loop or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers. Before we begin tonight, I would like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we, would like, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. And now, please welcome Associate Director Dr. Barbara Ballard. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll say good evening and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. Before I continue with the program, I would like to just highlight some of the upcoming events on the back of your program. If we look at them, I'll go through quickly. There's a discussion group that meets here every Wednesday uh, at 4 p.m. and the last one will be the 24th. And it's political campaigns, top to bottom, data, not door knocking, and everything about the midterms. Also, I want you to know on September the 30th, we have the Elizabeth Dole in leadership lecture. She was here last year and we're bringing three people this year and they will be discussing military caregivers. Then we have the Edward F. Riley lecture, Better Angels, Can We Depolarize um, America? And that's Thursday, October the 4th at 7 p.m. And a big one that people seem to be calling about and wanting to know about is Big Sonia screening and filmmaker uh, Q&A, and that's 2 o'clock on Friday, and we're talking about Holocaust survivors living in Kansas City, and again, the second part, October the 19th at 2 p.m. So I hope you'll able to attend those programs. I will say to you now that Dole Institute of Politics and the University of Kansas School of Law are pleased to present celebrating the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment. And this is our 13th annual Constitution Day program. Um, but before we do that, look on the inside of your program and you will see, uh, we do a little, little ceremony here. And on September the 17th, 1787, the Constitution was signed by 39 of the 55 founding fathers. And one of the things that we've been done that they do nationally as well, for those of you who have bells, please ring your bells and please join us in the preamble to the United States Constitution. Start ringing your bells and let's go. <coughs> we the people of the United, United States, States, in order to form a more perfect, perfect union, union, establish, establish justice, justice, ensure domestic, domestic tranquility, tranquility, provide for the common defense, defense promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Thank you very much for joining us in that. Proposed after the Civil War and ratified in 1868, the 14th Amendment is perhaps the single most important amendment to the Constitution. The 14th Amendment guaranteed citizenship to the former slaves and their descendants, and it also guaranteed due process of law and equal protection of the laws with respect to actions by state and local governments. This evening we will explore the amendment's history, importance, and enduring legacy. I would now like to introduce our guests for this evening. Our moderator is Stephen McAllister the United States Attorney for the District of Kansas. McAllister has served as the first State Solicitor General for Kansas and the ES and Tom W. Hampton Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Kansas. In 
He served as dean of the KU Law School from 2000 to 2005. Senior Judge John Lundstrom was first appointed to the federal bench in 1991. He served as his district's chief judge from 2001 through 2007. In 2018, he was appointed chair of the Budget Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States by Chief Justice John G. Roberts. Chief Justice Julie Robinson was appointed a United States District Judge for the District of Kansas in 2001 by President George W. Bush. Judge Robinson became Chief Judge of her court in 2017, effectively becoming the Chief Executive Officer of the court. She is the first African American appointed to the Federal District Court in Kansas and only the second woman. All three of tonight's guests are graduates of the U University of Kansas School of Law. We wanted to add that because I'm not sure we've ever had guests where all three <laughs> fit in that category. <laughs> now, of course, go ahead. <laughs> Also, I want you to know that our brief remarks about what they have done is so we can get with our program. But in your program, you have a more thorough um, introduction of each one of them. And I hope you will read them because it is, there, it's impressive. Why is it impressive? Because they have worked hard. They have earned it and they're gonna share a lot of their expertise with us this evening. With that in mind, please, I will turn it over to Steve McAllister, the moderator, but would you please give our guest a very warm Jayhawk welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, everyone can hear back there okay? All right. Well. It's my pleasure to have these two esteemed panelists, if you will, um, friends and colleagues for this discussion about the 14th Amendment. I'd like you to start thinking now about questions you might have or questions you might get to ask because in my experience, you don't get to ask federal judges questions very often. <laughs> it goes the other way. So this is your chance to, to question these two about all sorts of things. Uh, I want to go into my constitutional law professor mode for just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, the 14th Amendment <clears throat> is ratified in 1868, uh, obviously follows the Civil War, follows the 13th Amendment a couple years before, which abolishes slavery. But the 13th Amendment alone would not have guaranteed rights. It, it simply got rid of slavery. So the 14th Amendment is the amendment that is really crucial uh, in many, many ways. And one of the reasons it's crucial is earlier in the 19th century, the Supreme Court had, had a decision that said the Bill of Rights, so free speech, freedom of religion, search and seizure, all of that, it only applies to the federal government. <clears throat> does not bind the states at all. So the 14th Amendment is going to become the mechanism by which the Supreme Court over time will basically give all of us the Bill of Rights protections against all levels of government. So local, state, and the federal are bound by the Bill of Rights. So the 14th Amendment is important for that reason. If you look at the insert in your program, this was the professor's request. Um, so law students, and I see some of my former students in the crowd, you know, open your book and look at the text <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, if you look at the 14th Amendment, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons the 14th Amendment is also extremely important uh, is the very first sentence. Uh, and the very first sentence about all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside is basically the Constitution overruling the Dred Scott decision, which said that African Americans, their descendants, simply could not be citizens of the United States. So the 14th Amendment, first sentence, takes care of Dred Scott in that respect anyway. Then what you have are three clauses. Uh, and this is where it's kind of interesting. The first clause is called the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And all of these provisions you'll see are telling states you cannot deprive people or you must provide something 
to citizens. So again, this isn't for the federal government. 14th Amendment is directed at state and local governments. Uh, in the first clause, the privileges or immunities clause, there's argument about whether that was supposed to be a lot more than it has become. Uh, you could argue, while wow, the privileges or immunities of U.S. citizenship, that's my right to work, my right to live places, to travel, to go to school, to do all sorts of things. But in 1873, the Supreme Court said, no, it doesn't really mean much. Uh, an infamous decision called the Slaughterhouse Cases, they said it's things like you get to vote in federal elections. You can go to the post office. Uh, you can use the federal court system. That's not an insignificant one. You can use the seaports of the U.S., but they really limited the privileges or immunities clause very early on, five years after the amendment was ratified. Uh, the next clause you'll probably be familiar with, the due process clause, uh, which protects deprivations of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. We'll definitely be talking about that one tonight. That's one that from which what you might think of as the privacy and human dignity and those kinds of decisions have often come out of the due process clause of the 14th Amendment as liberty interests that the court is protecting. Uh, and then the final one, we will also be talking about the Equal Protection Clause, uh, which obviously is the basis for Brown versus Board and other cases we'll be talking about. So I do want you to keep that in mind as we go along, and I may refer back to it as we talk, because the 14th Amendment does so much. It's not one clause. It's not one provision. It's not one concept. It's a whole lot of things. Uh, and over time has become in my view, the single most important amendment probably. I mean, obviously you needed to get rid of slavery with the 13th Amendment, but in terms of creating rights, the 14th Amendment is the most important amendment and to the Constitution. So with that, I'd like to turn to our panelists, and we prepared a couple things, but I really have no idea what they're gonna say. So <laughs> we'll just get started um, by saying, I'd, I'd ask each of you to talk about a a 14th Amendment decision by the Supreme Court that you find particularly noteworthy, important, interesting. Just kind of talk about the case and what it means and even perhaps, you know, what it means today. Well, I'll start. The 14th Amendment has been referred to as the Great Amendment. And I think the most significant case has been the Brown versus Board decision case, which was a case that was decided under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, and it's been referred to as the case of the century. Um, others have referred to it as the case that really was the launching pad for many more um, civil rights acts and um, litigation and decisions as well that provided for equal protection of the law in a variety of other contexts outside of public education. But of course, the Brown versus Board case um, decided that the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause meant that African American children were entitled not only to a public education, but to an integrated public education, a public education sitting side by side um, other American um, children. And, um, you know, there's so many stories that can be told about why it's so significant, but it really, I think, was the product of years and years of strategy um, by a very bright group of lawyers primarily African-American lawyers, um, one of whom became the first African-American Supreme Court Justice, Thurgood Marshall, who was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1967, who decided that in light of Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the case that the Supreme Court said separate but equal um, ensures equal protection under the law. In light of the language of Plessy versus Ferguson, they decided their strategy in part was to focus on that language and to go about proving that separate facilities in public education were not equal. They weren't equal in a tangible way in terms of the money that was spent, the um, teachers, the, the resources, the curriculum, but they also were not equal in an intangible way because education is not only about things that you can buy and things that you can pay for, but education is about the experience and the um, the opportunity to um, fellowship with people that may be a little bit different than you and to learn from one another and to sit by one another and to feel like you are fully included in society. So Thurgood Marshall and others, um, you know, I read about Thurgood Marshall. He, he, he traveled more than 50,000 miles a year. 
for very little pay, and he was just one of many that devoted their lives really to this um, that culminated in, in the decision, the 1954 decision that we know as Brown versus Board. You know, and of course we all um, have a great affinity for the case because it, you know, the lead case, it was five cases of course that came before the Supreme Court and were argued together, but the lead case was out of Topeka, Kansas. Uh, 13 plaintiffs with 20 children that were in the Topeka Public Schools. Um, there were actually almost 200 plaintiffs across the other states that were involved in the litigation. But, you know, that was the lead case. I think that forevermore um, is something that we can be proud of as Kansans, that we had parents that were brave and were willing to fight this fight, and it was a long fight. Um, so I, I, I think that is one of the most, if not the most, significant 14th Amendment case because education is such a fundamental right. It is so, so, so core to our ability to operate. It's, it's, it's so core to our having liberty um, in this country. So it began with that, at least in terms of public education in the, in the lower schools. There had already been test cases and, and successful cases, actually, in higher education. Um, but that case, Brown versus Board, then launched us into so much more that, in terms of equal protection in public accommodation, housing, transportation, ultimately employment and all of that. Okay. Rich? Thanks, Steve. Uh, obviously, it's, it's hard to come up with something that would top Brown as far as being uh, the most memorable and important uh, 14th Amendment case. But there are, there are a lot of cases that we all know something about but don't necessarily relate to the 14th Amendment. Roe versus Wade, Bush versus Gore, Obergefell versus Hodges, the same-sex marriage case. All of these cases would not have been able to be decided on those subjects of abortion, ending an election, or allowing people of the same sex to get married, but for the 14th Amendment, allowing the federal courts to make rulings about things the states were doing. But I'm gonna take a more, perhaps, prosaic subject, uh, although I think it's really important, and that's voting rights. Uh, in a series of cases in the 1960s, uh, the seminal case for our purposes really being Reynolds versus Sims, the Supreme Court said that the idea of one person, one vote was something which had to be honored at the state level as well as in another case at the federal level under the Constitution itself. Before that time, state legislatures had been uh, many, uh, many instances uh, incredibly malapportioned. Uh, the usual situation was years would go by, population might change, rural folks moving to urban areas, but those rural districts continuing to have the same number of representatives. And so the whole election process got weighted towards particularly rural interests vis-a-vis -vis where the population was then living in the states. And with Reynolds versus Sims, the point was made that there is an equal protection interest there that your vote and my vote uh, ought to be worth the same whether we live in a rural area or an urban area or wherever we might happen to live. Uh, and that has had a profound impact on the ability of Americans to influence the way in which their state and local governments really uh, carry out their activities. Uh, I've had cases on that uh, level, uh, including uh, one in the 1993 called Helbus versus Brownback, uh, in which I found, and the 10th Circuit agreed I was right, which is nice when they do that, uh, <laughs> that the way in which the uh, Kansas State Board of Agriculture was constituted was unconstitutional because it was elected by people from farm organizations primarily, yet it had general governmental powers. Uh, it regulated the amount of pesticides you could put on your uh, lawn at home, uh, regulated the way gas pumps would work at the gas station. It wasn't just an agricultural promotion organization. Yet since 1917, Kansas had never changed the way it elected this board that had this general governmental power, and basically it was a very small electorate that did so. I found that that violated the uh, Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and violated the principles of one person, one vote, Reynolds versus Sims. And in more recent times, the Kansas legislature, after the last census, uh, didn't get around to <laughs> reapportioning, uh, and that left it in the laps of uh, three of us on the federal court to uh, decide how to do all of that. But we were guided by 
the one person, one vote principle of Reynolds versus Sims with regard to the state legislative districts as well as the other cases with regard to the, the federal uh, election districts. So there are real issues that we have to deal with in our courts that, as I say, are a little more prosaic than Brown, but I think are something that are extremely important for us all as citizens. Well, in those cases, one person, one vote still come up in various forms today. Um, and I will say, before I turn to the next question, one of the justices I was uh, fortunate to work for was Justice uh, Byron White. And he served from about 1962 until 93. And one of, when he visited the law school, one of our students asked him, what do you think was the most important decision or line of decisions in your time as a justice on the Supreme Court? And he actually said the one person, one vote cases he thought in terms of the practical effect they had were extremely significant. So, well, so that's, <coughs> we can always come back to some more historical perspective, but also curious what you might want to share with the audience about your modern experience, if you will. I mean, we're talking about cases that are 50, 60 years old, and once we bring in Dred Scott and the Slaughterhouse <coughs> and civil rights, we've gone back a long ways, but what about the kind of cases the two of you see that really flow from 14th Amendment principles, 14th Amendment doctrines? Is it still relevant and important today? Well, I would have to say that a pretty significant share of federal district court caseload is comprised of um, cases that are brought under tw Title 28 United States Code Section 1983, a civil rights statute, that um, people sue um, county and local governments and entities associated with that um, for deprivation of constitutional rights under the 14th Amendment. So uh, you know, if you call those 14th Amendment cases, and they are, I don't know what percentage, but they make up a pretty significant um, percentage of our civil caseload. So I mean, we can give you lots of examples, but one that comes to mind um, are you know, cases that are brought against police departments um, for excessive force or false arrest or, mali or uh, against the county for malicious prosecution. Um, there are lots of those cases across the federal government, and those are based on the 14th Amendment applying the Fourth Amendment which um, says that you have a right to not be subjected to unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, and so these are you know, based on um, an un perhaps unreasonable seizures of a person when they're taken into custody or their, their liberty in some way has been, um, has been um, restricted um, in, the, in the course of some interaction with law enforcement. Um, we get a fair number of those cases. Um, and then we get a number of cases I think that um, are brought under the due process clause um, of the of the um, amendment, procedural both procedural due process and substantive due process cases. Um, procedural due processes for uh, process cases, for example, if someone says that they um, had a property interest that was terminated in some way by um, um, a subdivision of the state without a procedural due process. Um, they didn't receive notice and, and an opportunity to be heard by a neutral decision maker. You know, one of those things or perhaps all of them. Um, so we get a fair number of those cases. We get cases that are brought against school boards often um, based on the procedural due process provisions of the, of the uh, 14th, or the, you know, the Fifth Amendment. Um, what else? There's so many. <laughs> uh, right. No, you're, you've covered the uh, waterfront uh, very uh, well. Um, you, you also sometimes see them in a slightly uh, unusual context. Some a case will, will wind up in your lap. For example, I had a case uh, brought by some parents in the Johnson County School District who argued that the local option uh, budget cap uh, was unconstitutional both violating due process and equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Uh, the idea being that the uh, School Finance Act basically said that there's a limit to how much local governmental units can spend to augment the, the uh, state uh, allocations. Uh, and these parents thought that that violated their constitutional rights to not be able to spend more. And they basically felt they had a right to compel an election to impose an additional tax. So that case, which involves a little bit unusual set of facts, uh, wouldn't have wound up in federal court, would or not, for those uh, prongs of the uh, 14th Amendment. Okay. So 
Chief, you mentioned procedural and substantive due process. Maybe the two of you could tease that out a bit with a little more explanation and some examples. I mean, this is a sense there's only, when you look at the insert, there's only one due process <laughs> clause. But the understanding as it's come to be through court interpretation is they're kind of two different tracks for due process claims. And so you want to just kind of talk about the difference and if you have examples from your experience or anything that you might want to share. Well, um, procedural due process really focuses on did a person receive a fair process? Um, were they, what the clause says is you shall not be deprived of, in, not deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So if someone, for example, is deprived of a property right, they have a right to have a fair process, meaning an opportunity to be heard, which sort of subsumes that they have to have a notice that they have an opportunity to, to be heard and that the, dis, the uh, issue itself will be decided by a neutral decision maker. Um, so there are a number of cases that are brought under that um, provision. Substantive due process, and of course the due process clause doesn't say anything about procedure or substance, but it has, um, the courts have interpreted these two tracks. So substantive due process is based on the notion that, particularly when we talk about liberty, that there are rights that are so fundamental to our liberty that this clause protects them. And so the Supreme Court jurisprudence has been that such rights as the right to marry, and in the Ober Ober Obergefell case, the right to marry not only someone of an opposite sex, but someone of the same sex, but the right to marry, the right to have children. Um, that there's Ro Roe versus Wade. The Roe abortion. versus right yeah, Wade. Those are, those are exactly, the process. right to procreate, the right to um, have an abortion, um, all of these have, the focus has been that that's a fundamental right that, you know, the language around, uh, I think, substantive due process often talks about autonomy and intimacy, intimate rights and, you know, uh, decisions that are so personal to you and so important to you that the government should not deprive of you, you know, irrespective of process, the government should not deprive you of that right. And, and here's, here's where those cases get really interesting as Steve knows better than we do since he's had that intimate involvement with the, the court and how they've tried to deal that at the highest level. But the first step they have to decide is, is there a fundamental right? Once they decide there's a fundamental right, then the uh, mechanism of the 14th Amendment provides a basis to have that, your protection of being able to exercise that right. So it's not so much a 14th Amendment analysis, because that, that kind of just falls into place. But the question is, is there a fundamental right to do a certain kind of thing or not to have a certain kind of thing happen to you and whatever the situation might happen to be? So it's a little more complicated than just what you would look at this piece of paper and think it might uh, turn out to be. Well, and there's, you know, there's obviously varying views about this. And if you read, um, most of the cases, the Supreme Court cases um, that um, talk about substantive process, there's very different views about whether something was a fundamental right and whether it was a fundamental right, right that was contemplated by the drafters of the 14th Amendment at the time they drafted. It was ratified in 1868, so it was, you know, it was drafted in the 1860s. So it took a, a couple of years. So, um, it, you know, the originalists, if you will, try to go back and say, is this something that they contemplated? What was the state of the law at that time? Um, was this something they had in mind when they drafted this language about not being deprived of liberty or not? Well, and sometimes, obviously, that, that will not justify a decision in favor of rights. So the uh, Obergefell is a good example. I mean, if you look at the same-sex marriage, and the question is, well, was that something society recognized 150 years ago, the answer is pretty clear. So there's kind of one line of justices <coughs> that tend to ask those questions. Was this really firmly rooted, well established, sort of known to the common law as they would call it, so we should recognize it as something embraced by the Constitution. But another view is that why are we, why are we going to limit ourselves to what was going on 150 or 200 years ago? Societies evolve. We better appreciate over time sometimes how important something is to people. And so the importance of the interest really ought to be a dominant factor in whether we recognize this or not. But you will see that tension 
constantly between the justices on the Supreme Court in these high profile cases. And that's primarily the difference between the so-called conservative justices and the so-called liberal justices. All of them would agree that once you decide there's a fundamental right, the 14th Amendment gives protection. But determining whether there is such a right and how you go about determining it is where the, the uh, debate really uh, uh, comes together. And I, I just want to add one thing on the substantive versus procedural. So as the chief said, the procedural is about process. So if you think about it, uh, if you've ever had land condemned, so a government wants to build a road or do something, you can't stop the government. You get a proper procedure, you get just compensation because of the Fifth Amendment, which also applies <laughs> through the 14th. So some things can be taken away by government. Your liberty can be taken away if you run through the criminal justice system with the appropriate rights and so forth. So procedure doesn't stop it from happening altogether. It just says government has to treat you in certain ways. But many of the substantive rights are basically saying, now you've hit territory where government just can't go. And it doesn't matter what the procedures are. These are decisions, actions, things that government just does not get to intrude itself into. Uh, one of my favorite procedural cases is an old one, I think from the 20s or 30s, that I like to point out to my students. I, the, the impartial decision maker, I think it was a judge whose salary came from the fines the judge collected <laughs> from the people who appeared in his courtroom. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, that doesn't really seem like a neutral decision maker <laughs> to us. So it can come up in a, in a wide variety uh, of ways. Well, let's talk about some of the other equal protection territories. So we touched on Brown, and we mentioned same-sex marriage, which ultimately was not an equal protection case, but there are components to some right. of those arguments. What are some of the other areas where equal protection has been important, and how, how have those kind of played out in the federal courts? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about it. <laughs> Well, you know, I, beca because I uh, uh, am kind of uh, focused on some of these voting rights cases, uh, I think that it, Bush versus Gore gets to be kind of interesting there. Because uh, in Bush versus Gore, there's an equal protection argument that's basically accepted by both, by seven out of the justice, seven of the nine justices, including several of those who are generally identified as liberal, that there is a, a equal protection concern about the way in which ballots are being evaluated in different counties in Florida and indicating that going back and having a recount in certain places would violate equal protection when it's not being done in other places. One of the justifications then for shutting down the election. Now where, where they got a little more concerned was what the remedy would be and whether or not they should go back and recount all the ballots as opposed to just stopping the recount altogether. But the basic fundamental concern is an equal protection argument about voters in counties where ballots weren't being re, uh, recounted. And Chief, I was thinking about maybe uh, Justice Ginsburg's professional career before she was a judge or a justice. You want to talk about the territory she was most interested in, the gender cases? Oh, absolutely. Well, um, I was about to say that you know equal protection cases arise really around the protected classes um, and different treatment, disparate treatment of protected classes, whether it's by race or gender or um, age. Um, and so, of course, Justice um, Ginsburg had a wonderful career um, bringing a number of gender cases um, in the realm of education and otherwise. Um, to fight disparate treatment and discriminatory treatment of, of women on the basis of their sex. Um, you know, we, we get a, a lot of cases around, um, well, based on discrimination. Um, some of them, the claims may not be brought under the 14th Amendment, per se. They may be, you know, brought right. under a statute, um, but nonetheless... Because the 14th Amendment just protects against state action, action by right. government. So if right. an employer discriminates against somebody, that's not a 14th Amendment issue, that's, that's part of the Commons or yep. some, some other provision. Right. So what are, are there other classes you would identify and then also maybe talk a little bit about are all classes given the same kind of treatment under the Equal Protection Clause? In other words, are all classes equal for <laughs> equal protection purposes? 
Yeah. The, pr the professor's really burned out. I know. I think <laughs> <laughs> we need to be asking him. <laughs> um, there, there are certain, there are certain classes. There are certain um, protected classes that um, are given, I guess, um, heightened rights, if, if you will, in, in terms of um, if there is a, a law passed that regulates or that does something that results in, in disparate treatment, um, let's say based on race, that is a highly protected class. So that law is, is, is looked at with great scrutiny. Um, the, the government, has, um, well, race, ethnicity, um, receive that heightened protection. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, lower, I mean, a, a lower sort of rational basis class would be perhaps where you live. Um, um, like, you know, when you start talking about, uh, I, well, I was going to say redlining cases, but those are based on race sometimes. But yeah. I mean, there are, there are certain disparities or differences in people that don't rise to that level. And so then if the um, state can show a rational basis for a law that has this sort of effect, um, then that, that statute will survive. So rightly or wrongly, for instance, usually subject to rational basis because you can't demand a right to drive at age seven, or you can't demand a right to drink in particular. There's so many things that age is a factor in the way it's regulated that that's been treated as sort of the minimum level of scrutiny. Uh, and I think gender, it's fair to say, historically was lower down has risen over time, and frankly, I think now is approaching the treatment that race gets, but I don't know if you have different views on that. I, I think it's pretty rigorous there, there, scrutiny. There probably are still a few more things that the courts have differences on gender compared to race, but I think you're right that the, that gap is closing. Okay. Well, uh, other cases from the court, big ones that you might want to mention or talk about that are in the 14th Amendment territory? Well, I mean, we've only mentioned in passing um, the case of the progeny of substantive due process. We talked about the fundamental right to, um, you know, reproductive rights being fundamental. And, um, you know, the cases that have, have uh, come out since Roe, again, it's analyzed under substantive uh, due process and, and is that that is a fundamental right. So the cases have sort of shifted to what are the regulatory restrictions that a state government or government might impose on this fundamental right and whether that plays undue burden on the woman. So it's, it's sort of shifted the analysis to look at how some the restrictions on. <laughs> well, that, as I think is probably apparent from what we've said so far, much of the law really is judge made. I mean, it is, it is a matter of what starting with really from the Supreme Court and then those of us out here in the field having to try to figure out what those people really mean uh, are the ones who actually are giving some contours to what the 14th Amendment means. There are statutes like Section 1983, which provide a, a vehicle for enforcing these rights. When it really comes right down to it, what are those rights are largely determined by judges making those decisions. Uh, as district judges, trial judges, like Julie and I are, we're, we're, at, the, we're at the very bottom of that particular process. We, we very rarely are out there causing too much trouble, I don't think. Well, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe so, but, <laughs> but the point is, it, 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 the, way our, the way our system works, uh, we, we have this tradition of common law in which judges try to figure out what the rules of the road ought to be based upon precedent and based upon what maybe changing times might happen to, to, to bring to it and so forth. And so those nine Supreme Court justices ultimately are the ones who have to look at this language, which is pretty bare bones, and then say, how does that apply to having an abortion? How does that apply to who I can marry? How does that apply to how I have my schools set up or my election process? They have to decide that. Our task as district judges, I think, is to try to figure out 
what they've said <laughs> those rules are and to try to apply those faithfully. And that's not always easy. As I told Steve earlier, the only reason I agree to be on this panel is I want Steve to apply, tell us about qualified <laughs> immunity, because that's the most difficult area of this whole subject matter. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's the task that people like Julie and I have, is to try to figure out what it is that the Supreme Court has told us those rules uh, are going to be and how they would apply under the facts of a given situation. The hardest part about that is that you have real people there now. It's not just a debating point. It isn't just originalism versus living constitution. I mean, it is Joe and Tom and Billy and Mary and Sally and so on and so forth, and they have real <coughs> concerns and real issues, and we're left in the first instance trying to figure out how all these rules apply to affect their real life problems. So that's, that's the challenging part. I will say this, though, just in terms of focusing on the part of your question that talked about enforcement, you know, so the Supreme Court, you know, announces a rule that, you know, has great breadth. We have to ultimately figure out how it applies to the situations presented to us in real cases and controversies as they are individually presented to us. But the judicial branch has no enforcement power. We don't have our own um, you know, um, cadre of police that go out and make sure that our rules are, our orders are enforced. And so we rely on the fact that the public, that our American fellow Americans recognize the rule of law and the force of that, and that we're governed by that. Even if we disagree with a particular rule of law, it is the rule of law. And so we really rely, I guess, on the American spirit and the American culture to understand, and, and largely it does, that that's the way our system operates, that we have a political voice um, through our votes and in other ways um, in terms of laws that are legislated, um, but there's this whole other body of law that's common law, that is judge-made law, and that there's a recognition that, that that has equal force too, and that is something that we all have to live with and abide by. So one thing I hear you telling us is you can't just pick up the Constitution and read it for a moment and have an answer to the case. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll see if we agree with you or not. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And at the end of the day, we know whose opinion matters. So. <laughs> um, well, so maybe just to follow up before we open for questions, uh, you kind of touched on this, Judge Longstrom, but maybe I, both of you, it might be good for the audience to hear, because there's a lot of stuff in the media anymore, and, and Supreme Court confirmations, as we've seen, become these huge political battles. Is there law here, or are these cases just a judge saying, well, I'd really like to see it come out this way, and that's how I'm going to decide it, so. You know, I think one thing that gets lost in the messaging is the fact that a great uh, percentage of Supreme Court decisions are unanimous. I think it's, is it 40 percent? That number sticks in my mind, and it may change from year to year. Um, but, you know, the, the cases that get talked about primarily are the cases where there's dissension and disagreement, and, you know, substantive due process is one of those areas where there's that kind of thing, and so people get the sense that it's just, you know, nine judges and, you know, just that disagree and they're just doing their own thing and that they're not um, paying attention to the law. And, you know, I think you hopefully have a sense tonight that, again, we're talking a bare bones constitution. And if you're someone that really wants to focus on what did the drafters of the 14th Amendment have in mind, that's a very difficult analysis. Um, it's always a difficult analysis, as Judge Lundstrom said, to figure out is it a fundamental right or not. And, you know, people look at these things differently, but they're not deciding them on the basis of their ideology. They're deciding them on the basis of this whole body of precedential law. And, you know, they're really doing, all of them are really doing their best um, to try to interpret that law in light of what their understanding is of what the Constitution says and, and what it was meant to say. What, what, I, what I would add to that is this. I, I, I have been now a federal judge since 1991. That's almost, what's 27 years. I have never heard a federal judge say, well, I was appointed by a Republican or I was appointed by a Democrat, so I'm going to rule this way or, or that way. I mean, the, the part, there's no partisan angle to it. What, what is, however, clear is how, what your legal philosophy may be. 
And just like we all have different ideas about all sorts of things in life, there can be a good faith difference between somebody who believes that the way to interpret the Constitution is to try to figure out what the drafters meant and those who say that's hamstringing ourselves, we need to be able to grow with the times. That's, that's a very consequential difference. That's a very consequential argument. It's the difference between five votes and four quite often on the Supreme Court because they have a different philosophy about how to solve that problem. And it's not because they want to do honor to President so-and-so or President such-and-such, -such, but because they have a good faith, different view about how one ought to solve that problem. And that's kind of what it boils down to. And uh, you can kind of predict if someone espouses a particular point of view, where he or she may fall on those kinds of uh, controversial decisions, but not necessarily because of their partisan stripe or who appointed them, but rather what that philosophy is. You know, and I will say at the trial level, because we are deciding cases on the basis of precedent that is authoritative, we have to follow. In the District of Kansas, we have to follow the, the, the rulings of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. And of course, we all have to follow the rulings of the Supreme Court. I would venture to say, and there are six active district judges and what, three, four senior judges, and we've been appointed by everyone through, from I think Gerald Ford, or Reagan at least. Re Reagan. Reagan through Trump on our court. And if you were to read our decisions, if you were to lay them out, let's just say on the same, same case, if we all wrote a decision on the same case, I would say in probably more than 95% of those cases, you couldn't say, oh, that's, a Ro that's Robinson writing that, or that's Longstrom. I mean, I don't right. think probably you could ever do it, actually, right. um, because it's, it's going to be very much the same. We're doing our best to apply the precedent, the authority that we have to follow, and we may write it a little differently. Some of the analysis may be different, but by and large, the decision's going to be the same. Yeah, she puts her footnotes at the end. I do mine in the opinion. <laughs> you can tell them the difference there. But. Mine's better. My, my method is better. <laughs> well, I like mine better. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're at a good point if anyone has questions for these two federal judges. As I said, it's a unique opportunity. So. President Obama and Eric Holder are working on partisan gerrymandering. You can't gerrymander on the basis of gender, racial. Can you gerrymander for Republicans and Democrats? Short answer is yes, historically, one can. And the Supreme Court has not come to grips with whether or not they're changing their views on that. I, I will say this, this, I'm saying this a little bit tongue in cheek. Having dealt with redistricting cases, I hope they don't say that partisan gerrymandering is illegal, because I don't want to have to figure that one out. I mean, that would really be hard. But, and I think that's, my guess is that the nine folks sitting there at the Supreme Court don't really want to figure that one out either. Yeah, well, they had a case, you know, last year that raised that very right. issue, and they managed to dodge it uh, because they basically said, if you're in one district, you cannot challenge the statewide right. map. You basically Same. have to complain about your district. So you didn't have standing to complain about the whole, so they've dodged it for now, but it's going to come back. Yeah. I mean, you know, and there's even a dispute about whether they can decide the issue. So a, an earlier case, they decided we don't know how what the rules would be for partisan gerrymandering, so it's what they call a non-justiciable. We, we won't even address it. My sense is several of them are well past that, <laughs> that point, but yeah. there might still be five who just say we don't know what the rules would be, so we're not even going to involve ourselves. Uh, but I have no doubt that the challenges are going to come back. They dodged it last term by finding no standing. And I say dodged it. I don't mean to impute bad motives, but they dodged it. So um, <laughs> they, they postponed it. It's, it's down the road a ways, yeah. but it's going to come back. So uh, we don't know, but I think they're going to be repeatedly asked to that, answer that question until they're definitive in some way. You talked about the concept of judge-made law. Can you explain how you correlate that within the context of the separation of powers, uh, Congress making the laws, judges 
ruling on the constitutionality, et cetera? Well, it's long been the law of the land that judges can interpret the Constitution and can interpret statutes. Just as the, this amendment is bare bones, um, oftentimes there's legislation that leaves open questions when you read it. Um, and that's the role of the courts. Um, people come to court to litigate that because it's not clear from the language in the, in the statute how it applies. Um, and it is the role of the, the court to interpret that. In fact, most of the law, I would say, not in the criminal area. The criminal area is statutory. It is there's clear that there's interpretation, but there's much more reading of the statute and what does the statute mean. But in, in the civil law, uh, whether it be contracts or torts or things like, torts like if you have an automobile accident or a doctor commits malpractice or whatever, those kinds of things, those rules going back forever in the English legal system, which we inherited when we became a separate country, are rules that are created by judges. So judge-made law in that sense, the common law tradition, is what our country was founded on. So it is not something that judges have kind of gone off on a separate track. It's how it was all understood it was going to work from the beginning. Most of the complaints about so activist judges going too far are when they don't like the ruling. Uh, and then kind of different, different sides think different things are activist judging. But the whole idea of judge-made law really is nothing controversial uh, at all. Back to gerrymandering. Shouldn't gerrymandering be just completely overturned and handed over to the courts and if not, what could be done to make, to make the process more neutral? And if anything could be done to make the process more neutral, why hasn't it? Charlie, uh, let, me, let me talk to that a minute because, again, having had my experience with this, I, I really wish something could change. But that's a political question. The legislature of Kansas would need to decide, for example, that we need a nonpartisan redistricting commission. Some states have that, and it's the legislature doesn't do it. They try to take the politics out of it. They sit down, much like I think the three judges who did our last districting here did, and figure it out with maps and population and all these other kinds of things. But that's a political decision that the legislature would need to make. You'd have to ask our legislators why they haven't made that decision, uh, but that's a decision that they would need to make. In the meantime, there's nothing that the courts are in a position to do other than to deal with it around the edges of where it somehow violates the various rules that have been established. But uh, personally, speaking as a citizen, not as a judge, but as a citizen, I wish we had a nonpartisan uh, redistricting commission like other states do. Hello, thank you all for uh, this wonderful discussion tonight. Um, my question is, you started uh, tonight talking about how the 14th Amendment was vital because it has incorporated um, the Bill of Rights um, to the states, but actually there's still several provisions in the Bill of Rights that haven't been incorporated. The Second Amendment wasn't even incorporated until McDonald in 2010. Can you talk about that process of how the rights have been incorporated kind of piecemeal over time and um, how, what effect that has had. You're looking at me? Steve, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that? I think that's an academic <laughs> question, yeah. Steve. <laughs> yeah, well, so this is a, you know, an interesting debate. So originally, who knows if the, the ratifiers actually ever thought about this, but in the 20th century, the argument starts being made the due process of law includes things that are just so important that they ought to be part of it. And the, the split between the justices over time was do you take everything in the Bill of Rights, because those are sort of a list of the fundamental rights written out. You don't have to divine those. Those are written out. Uh, or do you pick and choose? Certain ones qualify as so important that they should be incorporated and therefore required as a matter of due process or not. Justice Black is the one who's famous for saying it should be all of it, but the rest of the court 
never quite bought that approach, although the end result is darn close. So it took a lot of years because they keep taking not just each amendment, but often each clause within an amendment and decide, does this have to apply to the states or not? So one thing I'd correct slightly in your comment, there are very few that are not incorporated. So you, the quartering of troops in the Third Amendment is not imposed yes. against the states. <laughs> it's also the amendment I don't think there's ever been a case on <laughs> in any court. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, you have to be indicted by a grand jury. The court has not applied that to states, so many states don't use grand juries. Uh, and then the Seventh Amendment, right to a jury trial, in all civil cases amounting or involving more than 20 bucks. So you sort of get a sense of inflation, what they thought was a sufficient measure. But those are really the only three. I mean, all of the cr criminal procedure protections besides grand jury, all of the First Amendment, speech, religion, press, as you noted, McDonald's, Second Amendment, all of that has been incorporated at this point. But it's often referred to as selective incorporation, which is what we had, or total or complete incorporation, which Justice Black advocated but could never get many votes for. But the end result is 150 years after the amendment is ratified, almost everything in the Bill of Rights now applies to the states just like it does to the federal government. And I don't think that's surprising because most things like that happen incrementally by a particular case raising an issue and then that case being decided and saying, yeah, this is something that's important enough. Generally speaking, courts, including the Supreme Court, don't reach beyond the issues in a particular case and say, well, not only free speech should be incorporated, but also something else. They, they would be looking at what the particular case was. So the fact that it's been incremental is not necessarily surprising, Justice Black's preference to the contrary notwithstanding. So the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment so has been incorporated, but there's a piece of it that might apply to excessive fines as being unusual or cruel. That has not been incorporated. That has One not could been. see how you get the right case. Yeah. You know, it comes. Yeah. Those kind of things have come up, you know, at least in part, in Ferguson and some of these other places, and how that might ultimately lead to a and case. And in fact, they may have a case on that. They have something to do with excessive fines on this term's docket. I don't know if it's an mm. incorporation question, mm. but they have something yeah. to do with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, my question is regarding fundamental rights. Um, we know how lucky we are to be of the generation after board. What do you folks see as um, any, fo foresee any fundamental rights in our future? We are hearing on the political platform, um, health care being provided being a fundamental right. We hear about um, secondary education. What do you see for as a fundamental right that you can see our country expressing a need for in this generation and even in the next? Steve, why don't you take that? <laughs> <laughs> I can. They have to be a little careful because cases may come in front of them. Uh, the way I'd respond to that is there are some constitutions around the world. I mean, by no means is the American Constitution the only model out there. And there are some, particularly much more modern constitutions. The Indian Constitution may be one. South African definitely is. So some constitutions have chosen to recognize what people call affirmative rights. You have a right to housing, you have a right to employment, you have a right to education, you have a right to health care. Our constitution has always been conceived, I think, by the courts and by the drafters is what you might call negative rights. The government can't unreasonably search you. The government can't put you in jail without due process. So it has not recognized those affirmative rights so much. Now, substantive due process in a way kind of is that affirmative, you have privacy and intimacy interests that, that you do get to assert. But there's a case that follows Brown by about 20 years, I think, uh, out of Texas where the argument was the disparate funding of school districts. Right. And one of the arguments was there's a fundamental right to education under the US Constitution and the majority of the court said no. That's not how our Constitution works. It's not in there. It's not written in there, we can't imply it. So what you have instead is, well, your school district has to be treated equally. You have equal protection rights, but you don't have that affirmative right to an education. So 
unless the court were to make a dramatic shift, my guess is you'd need constitutional amendments. But there's no reason those could not be proposed as a right to health care, right to education. Right. And, like, and, that, and that illustrates, too, the point we were talking about earlier, because in Kansas, of course, there's been a lot of, in the state courts, litigation about education right. because of state constitutional provision which guarantees an adequate education. So that's, that's, the, that's a recognition of a right in the Kansas Constitution that the Kansas state courts have been wrestling with over the last many, many years trying to figure out how to implement. I'm curious about the um, the way our representatives are chosen around the country and the census form that's being sent out and the argument and discussion right now about whether or not one has to be a citizen to fill that form out or to be counted in that census tract in order to determine how many representatives we'll have. It seems to me like the 14th Amendment uh, touches on that. You all mentioned that way early on in this conversation. Would you care to speak about it? Yeah, it's one I'd prefer not I, to speak I about. I would not. Because, because, <laughs> I, because, because it, I could imagine having to speak on it someday, you know, writing something down on a piece of paper. But uh, yeah. Steve? Uh, yeah, no, well, I'm, I'm going to be careful, too. But um, oh, good, good point. You know, I, I would, though, refer back to, you know, anytime you have disparate treatment, there's the potential for equal protection claims. Now, the questions will be, do I have, is there a protected class? Is there something the courts need to do here by way of elevating scrutiny. But if you can identify discrete classes, then it's at least the possibility to make an equal protection claim. And I would go to Chief Judge Robinson's point about, you know, equal protection applies to persons. They did not, it does not say citizens. So you might have arguments there that even though those affected might not be citizens, the equal protection clause could still apply to them. But that's probably as far, if not, farther than I need to go on that topic, so. Well, I, I don't remember said, you said that. <laughs> I thought it said, though, that the, the, uh, in the 15th Amendment, the right to vote is, is provided specifically in that 15th Amendment, and, uh, and that, would, that would deal, I guess it maybe doesn't deal with that piece, but that would deal with, well, then who exactly does have the right to vote? That's one of the great mysteries of the Constitution, actually. Nowhere does the Constitution guarantee the right to vote. So what the Constitution does, it tells us how to apportion representatives and districts. The 15th Amendment actually says you can't deny the right to vote on account of race or color. But it doesn't say who has the right to vote. Now you do have the one, um, oh gosh, what is it, 25 or 26, the 18 year old. Right. So you have one constitutional amendment that said you can't deny people the right to vote because of age once they reach 18. And that was a Vietnam era you're old enough to go die for your country, you ought to be old enough to vote. Uh, but nowhere does the Constitution, so that's actually kind of one of the interesting parts of Bush v. Gore, too, is nowhere does the Constitution say, you know, there's nothing in the Bill of Rights that says, number 11, you have the right to vote. It's not in there. So there's lots of provisions that kind of affect voting and deal with elections and so forth, but they never specified, other than I think there's the provisions in Article One that say, the electors for members of Congress will be whoever the states say are eligible to vote in their elections. So there's this weird connection between state eligibility and federal eligibility. So. Um, as I um, look through this 14th Amendment, I can't help but think about Jim Crow laws um, and um, the laws that were enacted that did deny equal protection for, for blacks in the South. Um, I'm just wondering, was there a blatant disrespect of the law by the judges, or was there a way they got around that by certain statutes or um, rulings that helped them to be able to enact these? Well, the around, Sorry, well shortly after, so the, the Union troops withdrew from the South in 1877, and the Southern states enacted all these black codes that really were sort of the beginning of Jim Crow that of course continued into the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, Brown was decided in 1954. Um, 1964 was a you know, major Civil Rights Act. 1965, Voting Rights Act. So, so those were in response to Jim Crow, but as we all know, 
Jim Crow still continued. I mean, it was a slower death than it should have been. Um, so I, I guess I would say, you know, before Brown and before those cases that started talking about and started telling us that there had to be protection of the laws in all of these public accommodations, all of these states were free to, to do whatever they wanted to do. I mean, Brown was the case that said, you know what, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause means that black children have the right to um, integrated education and from there spawned others. But before that, you know, these states were operating as if the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause did not apply to all of these uh, various laws that restricted the rights and, of black and citizens. And they, they, de they developed this, this uh, uh, sort of myth of separate but equal that Plessy recognized that basically said, well, as long as we have a water fountain that says whites and water fountain that says coloreds, hey, you know, there's no equal protection problem there. So they developed this, this uh, patina that allowed them to carry out those particular Jim Crow laws. But it was largely a political decision to let the South go its own way. Uh, uh, Reconstruction had, had kind of worn out the North. Uh, the Republicans made a, made a compromise in 1876 to get Southern votes, ended Reconstruction, pulled out the troops, and there wasn't the political will again until 100 years later, almost, to actually say, wait a minute here, uh, this, this Constitution means something other than what you're doing. And I'd say if you, if you really want to see the rationales, look at the Plessy decisions. So in 1896, and you'll see the majority. And there, there's no escaping. There's just racism throughout the opinions. Uh, but basically, the two competing views, well, what, what's the big deal? The majority says if, if one side or the other, if you want to put it that way, feels this is a disadvantage or an inferiority, that's their problem. This is equal treatment under the law. You both have a, a facility. Uh, Justice Harlan, the first right. one, says that can't possibly right. be right. This is a colorblind constitution. You right. can't make these kinds of distinctions. Although I will note Justice Harlan had racial issues of his own very much. The one thing I'll add to the Plessy, this is a Kansas connection. The only Kansas justice, David Brewer, was on the court when Plessy was decided, but we'll never know whether he'd have been on the right side or the wrong side of that one, because a few days before the oral argument, his daughter died in Lansing, Kansas. So he was actually absent and did not participate in the case. Hmm. So, but there were at least, you know, there was somebody there, Justice Harlan, who said this can't be right. But it's, it's very racist and it's really kind of hard to swallow. I know when my students read that opinion, it's, there's some really difficult Supreme Court opinions from history just to read, yeah. Well, and you know, I, I think the Brown decision was important in the sense that it talked about how tangibly separate but equal was a fiction, as well as intangibly it was. But I mean, one of the cases um, that was part of the collection of Brown cases was out of D.C., and there was a high school in D.C., and this shows you the fiction of the separate but equal doc doctrine. That high school had a science lab that consisted of a goldfish bowl and one Bunsen burner. That was it. That was their equal facility. So, I mean, the lawyers that brought these cases fought many of them on the basis of the tangible differences, although always made the arguments about the, the importance of the intangible um, effects, the effects of the, the intangible effects of segregation as well. We will have one last question. This may be a little more of a softball question, more neutral, but I've always wondered about class action suits and how you decide um, such suits and whether they apply just federally or also at state level, local level. Uh, I imagine that, except for specifics around a particular case, a lot of complaints would apply to a lot of people. So are they automatically class action if it's not just related to this one person? May I ask if you are you a corn farmer by any chance? <laughs> okay, <we're, laughs> then, then, I, then I'll speak that a little bit more. But, uh, <laughs> I, I've handled a number of class action cases. I have one now that's a national case involving basically every corn farmer in America as a putative class member. But uh, uh, there are state class actions and there are federal class actions, uh, and it really has nothing to do with Fourteenth Amendment, of course. 
but it's a way basically to, as a practical matter, to allow people to litigate something together to create both a cost benefit to the individuals who would be make up the class and a way to bring finality really to both sides, including the defendant, by getting a ruling rather than having 100,000 different lawsuits spread all over the country. So the, the idea of class actions is, a, I think, a very practical and pragmatic way to deal with resol resolution of disputes. Now, like anything else, it's subject to abuse or whatever you might want to say. But the, the idea of it is a very uh, is based in, in practical uh, necessities. And another practical um, component of that is people may have actually very small claims, right. you know, in the consumer protection area. They may right. have, you know, it wouldn't be worth their while to pursue this relief, but yet there may be hundred, you know, tens of thousands of them that have uh, suffered, you know, the same injury. So it's another very utilitarian approach to allowing people to come together with small claims, but yet s uh, seek and obtain relief as a class. Yeah, and I would say class action is really a procedural mechanism, but they could well involve 14th Amendment claims. So you certainly have class course, actions yeah. where it's based yeah, it's on true, racial true. discrimination, yeah. gender discrimination, those kinds of things. Sure. Yeah. With that, time. I'm going to say thank you so very much. What a wonderful crowd tonight. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> Let me just add, you know, from sitting here and standing in the back, I think we have more attorneys in this room <laughs> than most people would know. But thank you all so very much. And I want to just remind you about our program on uh, September the 30th, which is our Women's uh, Leadership Lecture Series. But most of all, thank you for taking your time to come this evening. And I want you to give a really big Jayhawk welcome to these three guests this evening. They were superb. Again, thank you very much, and I'm sure they'll stay around for a little while if you have some questions. Thanks again.